university. Thank you. At the University of uh, Minnesota Medical School. Um, he uh, is from Maple Plain, Minnesota. And he completed his undergraduate work at, in chemistry and physiology at St. John's University uh, in Collegeville, Minnesota, and went on to earn his PhD in pharmacology from the University of Iowa. He then moved to Stanford University School of Medicine where he earned his MD and completed an internal medicine residency. And then moved on to the University of Minnesota in 2012 where he completed fellowships in cardiovascular medicine, critical care cardiology and interventional cardiology. So he's board certified in all of these, you know, in IM, cardiology, CCM, interventional cardiology. And he's the medical director of the cardiovascular intensive care unit. His research interests include resuscitation, advanced hemodynamic support, and recovery from cardiac arrest. He has performed research in the field of ischemia and reperfusion injury for 20 years, describing molecular pathways of injury in models of cerebral ischemia and investigating potential therapies to mitigate the effects of reperfusion injury in heart transplantation, MI, and refractory cardiac arrest. He's the Associate Medical Director for the Center of Resuscitation Medicine and the President of the Minnesota Mobile Resuscitation Consortium, where he works to improve survival in patients suffering cardiac arrest. This work has resulted in the development of protocols utilizing rapid, rapid transfer from the field periphery placed VA ECMO, coronary reperfusion, and subsequent cardiac intensive care to improve outcomes for patients with refractory VTVF cardiac arrest. And this latest uh, interest of his is going to be the topic of uh, discussion today as New York and its uh, emergency response system gear up to uh, make something similar happen right here in the Big Apple. So take it away, Dr. Bartos. And once again, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. And thank you for having me. Uh, it's a lot of fun to talk about this. And certainly it is a topic for discussion. So if, uh, if there are things that um, intrigue you or things that aren't clear, please let me know. I'm happy to talk about it. I have extra time at the end too, uh, if other people want to talk beyond the scope of this uh, particular uh, session. Um, can you see my slides there? I, I've yes, shared my we okay, can. Perfect. perfect. So again, I will be talking about ECPR or extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation, uh, specifically in the setting of refractory cardiac arrest um, and how we build these people back or, or contribute to their recovery such that they can get back to a normal life. And I do approach this from both the perspective of an intensivist as well as an interventionalist. And so uh, I think that perspective informs my discussion. Certainly, I'm open to other perspectives as well as we talk about it. My disclosures are here, really just some grant funding for uh, the rest trial, uh, some more basic science work, and then also uh, some charitable uh, donations for uh, uh, assistance for our local program for refractory cardiac arrest and then um, some memberships with AHA. So I'm gonna start talking about refractory cardiac arrest, just some basic epidemiology, then talk about ECPR and how we've applied it here in Minnesota, and then uh, the critical care approach for these patients. So as many of you know, there are 600,000 cardiac arrests in the United States each year. About two thirds of those are out of hospital cardiac arrests. And if you look at that as a disease entity, it's about the third leading cause of death in the United States. The vast majority of the survivors coming from the shockable rhythm group in all likelihood because of the pathology and because of the reversibility with defibrillation, which can be applied in the field. And if you look at all the ACLS therapies, despite the amount of time we spend learning ACLS and performing ACLS during codes, really early CPR and early defibrillation are those therapies best demonstrated to improve outcomes despite the epinephrine, the vasopressin, the bicarb, and all the things we may do um, during a code process. Uh, and albeit many of these things are difficult to study, still what really comes through is that perfusion uh, is the goal um, of ECLS in, in the vast majority of patients. When we looked at our data in Minnesota uh, over the 
five years from 2011 to 2016, we saw that about two or one third of our patients had shockable rhythms out of 7,500 cardiac arrests during that time, about 2,500 had a shockable rhythm. And if you look at the graph on the right, this just demonstrates where we lose the majority of our patients. So the, the data is normalized to 100%. And as you go through the phases of these patients' recovery, first requiring ROSC, then being admitted to the hospital, then hopefully being discharged with, and the CPC one and two, is an assessment of neurologic function with the cerebral performance category, where one and two is effectively no impairment or uh, minimal impairment in neurologic function. But what you can see, while 32% of our patients with shockable rhythms, the red line, were discharged from the hospital with neurologically favorable survival, we lost the biggest portion of those patients at the very first step, the, get, the achieving ROSC. So 46% of our patients died because they failed to achieve ROSC. And that's the refractory population. Those are the people we're targeting with eCPR. eCPR doesn't necessarily affect the other portions uh, of their recovery, but really getting them to the point where we can stabilize them and get them admitted to the hospital is the key. Now, why is ROSC the major limitation? It's really time. So as you go across, and many of us are familiar with this from our experience with codes, if you can get them back in the first few minutes uh, you're in good shape, but be, after that point, your likelihood of getting ROSC really tails off. And once you get to about 30 minutes of CPR, uh, you're at the 15 to 20% rate of ROSC, uh, and you really start to worry that you're not going to achieve ROSC at all at that point. And then we know, again, overall, about 50% of people in national studies are refractory. Even those with shock rhythms are refractory to ACLS uh, and die due to refractory cardiac arrest. So where uh, patients that have cardiac arrest really have their hurdles in terms of survival is first and foremost ROSC. Second, re-arrest. About a third of those patients that achieve ROSC will re-arrest, which exposes them to more risk of low flow state, even with CPR, uh, or failure to achieve ROSC again, in which case they would die from their re-arrest. And then the last hurdle is neurologic recovery, and that is a sizable hurdle, as we'll talk about in a bit. Now, when we think about any state a disease state where perfusion is uh, a problem, really the primary treatment these days is reinstatement of that perfusion. So obviously myocardial infarction, we're all familiar with stents, stroke, lytics, and more recently thrombectomy. And in cardiac arrest, I mentioned early CPR and defibrillation are the two most uh, beneficial therapies uh, to patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. There's also active compression, decompression, and impedance threshold device, which in combination was shown to be beneficial. Uh, those devices are basically devices that provide de active decompression to the chest wall, pulling more blood into the intrathoracic space and increasing preload during CPR. And the impedance threshold device, which creates a ongoing negative pressure uh, in the chest, which again, increases preload for the heart. So functionally, all three of those uh, treatments are really focused on perfusion. ECMO provides even more perfusion, and it's when used for uh, cardiac arrest can really replace cardiac output. So this is a schematic uh, of ECMO uh, in your average patient, and this is VA ECMO, uh, veno-arterial ECMO. Now in this schematic, the uh, venous cannula is in the femoral vein, pulling blood out with a pump which is then pushing it through an oxygenator where oxygen is provided and carbon dioxide is removed. And then it's pumped back in this schematic into the carotid artery, which of course would not be how we would do it in most adults. Uh, while they do uh, carotid sticks and uh, cannulation in children, in adults, especially in the setting of eCPR, generally it would be in a femoral artery. So peripheral VA ECMO, again, what we're using for eCPR is shown here on the left. Uh, with the venous cannula uh, in the femoral vein and the arterial cannula in the femoral artery. They can be uh, bilateral or they can be unilateral with both cannulas on the same side. The picture in the upper right is a picture from our uh, one of our patients where you have the bright red uh, blood in the going in the arterial cannula, the darker purple blood in the venous cannula. And then we have this cannula or really a MAC sheath pointed down the leg. This is the distal perfusion cannula. And we, over the course of time, have learned, at least for our patients, that really every patient needs a distal perfusion cannula. There are centers and uh, patient populations where people try to choose and select patients for that. Uh, but in our patient population, what we found is 
those tools are not very effective uh, when used at the time that we're placing the ECMO. The patient's condition is rapidly changing, and many of those patients still needed a cannula later, and it was much harder to place later. So we've gone to placing distal perfusion cannulas in every patient uh, that we put on ECMO to avoid risks of limb ischemia. We do place the ECMO uh, cannulas as well as the distal perfusion cannula with ultrasound guidance, and we have fluoroscopy in the cath lab to confirm placement uh, and guide placement as well. We use 15 to 17 French arterial cannulas, 17 French typically um, most adults um, can uh, use, but the 15 French do use in particularly petite people uh, with small arteries. And then 25 French venous cannulas and essentially everyone. Can you hear me? I believe I'm unmuted now. So uh, I will just say one more thing about this, which is that we do provide therapeutic hypothermia for our patients with a goal temperature of 34 degrees uh, C for most of our patients. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Functionally, most of our patients, because they're receiving CPR for about an hour, come in cold. And they may not quite be at 34 degrees, but many of them are already at 34 degrees. If not, uh, they are usually around 35 degrees. So it's not really uh, inducing cold as much as it's maintaining the temperature where they arrive. Uh, and we do use the CardiHelp uh, device shown here in the bottom center. Um, the nice thing about the CardiHelp is that it's small and portable and these patients uh, move around the hospital a bit for scans and things. And also we can uh, receive a lot of additional data from that device. So not only the flows and pressures, but we also get hemoglobin levels looking for traumatic bleeds. Uh, we also get SVO2 and temperature from that. So we can help guide our resuscitation a bit with that additional data. Uh, so really what ECMO provides is, is it alleviates the first two barriers to survival. It eliminates the need for ROSC, no matter what their rhythm is, because we're providing a full cardiac output, we're able to uh, eliminate that need for immediate ROSC. We also don't have to worry about rearrest because even if they go back into VF, uh, we can support them fully with the ECMO pump. It doesn't directly affect neurologic recovery, though it does uh, provide a baseline of hemodynamic support, which uh, at least reduces ongoing injury um, in the brain. Now, certainly many groups have done eCPR across the world, uh, and many small studies have been published showing those results, varying ways of doing it. Um, in the ED, in the cath lab, in the ICU. Um, I'll describe our model, which is a cath lab-based model. Um, people have different uh, selection criteria uh, for different rhythms and ages and those sorts of things. And we'll talk about that a bit as well. Um, but with that comes varying survival rates. And I think there are ways to optimize your survival depending on what you're trying to do at what stage your program is in. Uh, if you're really trying to optimize your survival uh, you will take people with shorter durations of arrest who have shockable rhythms. Some centers choose only those who have witnessed arrests or those with bystander CPR. Um, those can all uh, accentuate or um, optimize your survival rates, uh, but it does decrease your numbers. And so uh, in centers where you may not have a number, a, a large number of patients with refractory arrest available to you, you may also choose to have a little more lenient uh, enrollment criteria so that you can have the number of cases you need to maintain proficiency and uh, increase expertise uh, with this patient population. This is a picture from France and Paris. They uh, have gone to a pre-hospital model of eCPR in, to some extent because they couldn't get patients to the hospital with the speed they needed to be uh, to provide uh, quality care that they wanted to provide and have the survival rates they wanted. So they've gone to move that ECMO support uh, to the pre-hospital setting. That of course adds logistical complications as well, uh, but in their situation, it works for them. We have chosen the cath lab for our patients because we're able to get them to us with reasonable speed uh, and get them on ECMO um, relatively quickly. And I'll talk more about our program specifically here. So 2015, we started the Minnesota Resuscitation Consortium's Advanced Perfusion and Reperfusion uh, Life Support Program. That's basically the eCPR program. We had three main priorities from the beginning. The first was to mobilize patients rapidly from the field. Yeah. The second was to uh, achieve 
hemodynamic stability uh, with the ECMO and really bridge them to the ability to treat and diagnose underlying etiologies, uh, including primarily uh, coronary artery disease. These are the criteria we use to select patients. So first we have the paramedics selecting people in the field, and those inclusion criteria are quite broad, ages 18 to 75. Shockable rhythms is the presenting rhythm. That's our most strict criteria. That said, uh, they do have to be refractory in their shockable rhythm if they have ongoing shockable rhythm, but they can also be shocked into PA or asystole and still qualify. So really it's the presenting rhythm that matters. If they are still in a shock rhythm, they have to have received at least three shocks and a dose of amiodarone and still be in uh, that uh, shock rhythm or at least in cardiac arrest. They do all have to qualify for a Lucas CPR device. The biggest qualification there is body size, uh, but you can fit a lot of person into a Lucas device. So it's not a, a big exclusionary criteria in that sense. But we do want our paramedics to be able to provide CPR in a high quality way uh, during transport without endangering our paramedics. So that's why the Lucas requirement is there. Then we ask that they're roughly within 30 minutes drive time of the University of Minnesota for this program as well. Although what I've learned early on in this program is that paramedics are eternally optimistic about drive time. And so as I'll show you, we have patients that have come from much further away uh, than 30 minutes and we still include them in everything that we do. We do exclude people who are DNR, DNI, people who are coming from nursing homes, not necessarily rehab centers, rehab centers we take people from, dialysis centers we take people from, but uh, nursing home residents, we do not as a surrogate for severe chronic disease. And we do not take patients with a clear non-cardiac etiology and you can read into that trauma. Uh, and there we worry about the bleeding risks. Uh, and once they are selected by those criteria, the paramedics bring them to us. And the first thing we do is the first orange box uh, which is uh, achieve access in the artery and vein, the femoral artery and vein. And the first blood that we remo re remove from the femoral artery uh, is handed off for a blood gas performed in the cath lab. And that is looking for PaO2 and lactic acid uh, from that blood sample. And then we ask the paramedics about end tidal CO2. So if a patient has at least two of these criteria met, we will go on and cannulate them. And that's an end tidal CO2 greater than 10, a PaO2 greater than or equal to 50, and a lactic acid less than or equal to 18. So as long as they meet at least two of those criteria, we put them on ECMO with the cannulas that I mentioned. We perform the coronary angiography and PCI as indicated, uh, and we may uh, provide a balloon pump or a radial art line and a cooling catheter. If they don't meet those at least two of those criteria, then we declare them dead in the cath lab, and we consider that a failed resuscitation. Something happened along the way, could be a large aspiration event, could be an in, uh, issue with uh, intubation, uh, et cetera, that um, causes uh, those values to be poor, in which case they're declared dead in the cath lab. If we do cannulate them and we uh, do all those other procedures, at that point, the clock starts for 90 minutes to achieve an organized rhythm. Many patients will already be in an organized rhythm at that point, but if they're not, then we have 90 minutes of ongoing medical care uh, to try to achieve an organized rhythm essentially not a systole and not VF. It can be a fib flutter, it can be VT. Um, that's, all of those are okay, but just not uh, ongoing VF or a systole. If they don't achieve an organized rhythm after 90 minutes of ongoing medical care, then uh, we declare them dead in the cath lab. But after those 90 minutes, the vast majority of people will have an organized rhythm and we can admit them to the ICU. So this is from the first four years of our program, just to give you a sense of the patients we see and the circumstances in those inclusion criteria, et cetera. So we had 160 patients over the first four years. 17% of those were excluded because of blood gas issues. The, by and large, it's mostly the PaO2, uh, though lactic acid does screen out some as well. Uh, we then had 83% of those people that achieved full treatment, including uh, ECMO. 8% of those failed to achieve a uh, organized rhythm despite all that medical therapy. And that resulted in 76% of the total patients that arrived being admitted to the cardiac ICU with ECMO uh, and ongoing resuscitation. Of all those patients that received full treatment, uh, including the ECMO, 39% of those patients left the hospital with neurologically favorable status. The average age for those patients, the overall patients arriving through this program was 57, predominantly male, predominantly Caucasian, matching the demographics of our area. 
um, the male, we believe predominantly male because of the predominance of coronary artery disease as the etiology for this refractory shock rhythm. 76% were witnessed arrest, 66% received by standard CPR, 35% arrested in public location. And on average, they received 60 minutes of professional CPR, meaning from the time EMS arrived to the moment ECMO began. This led us to perform the arrest trial. So this is the first randomized controlled trial for ECMO in the setting of cardiac arrest in the world. Uh, it is single center uh, through the University of Minnesota, but multiple EMS agencies bring their patients to the University of Minnesota. And this was just published last year. We were expecting to enroll about 80 patients in the trial, and it was an adaptive trial design where the enrollment would start 50-50, but then would shift uh, to the more beneficial arm if there was one at each of the pre-specified uh, points to check in. We had 36 patients that were assessed for eligibility. Six of those were excluded because of actually having an initial PEA rhythm rather than a shock rhythm. Uh, more than 30 minute transfer time and um, three patients that had ROSC after the second shock. We had 30 patients then that were enrolled, 15 in each arm because this was still in the one to one or 50 50 um, uh, percent uh, split. One of the patients in the ECMO facilitated resuscitation, which is essentially the program uh, that I've described, one of those patients refused to be included. After the fact, this study was all performed under EFIC or ex exemption from informed consent because we can't randomize people while they're, uh, ha they have ongoing cardiac arrest. The other 15 patients were uh, randomized to standard ACLS. So when we are making these comparisons, I'll show you it's 14 patients uh, that received ECMO and 15 patients that received standard ACLS. And the reason that we had so few is because it was stopped early because of the dramatic effect that we saw with 43% survival in the arm that received ECMO facilitated resuscitation and 7% survival in the standard ACLS group. And that 7% is one patient uh, who survived uh, to discharge, but then died um, at around day 107. And so these results led to uh, stoppage of the trial um, and really the declaration that it was unethical at that point for us to randomize patients to standard ACLS uh, and, uh, per, and deprive people of the ECMO facilitated resuscitation. When we look at long-term outcomes from patients, so this is not in the randomized control cohort, this is in our standard or our cohort from the University of Minnesota ECPR program. Uh, we have looked at mortality over time. And so over three years, uh, and what we see is there are two distinct populations. There are those patients that we discharge to home or to an acute rehab, and there are those patients that we discharge trached uh, and going to a long-term acute care hospital uh, for hopeful decannulation of the trach. If you look at those that, are, um, that go home or do acute rehab, that's 78% of the people that we discharge. Uh, we have about 80% survival. Uh, uh, sorry, we have about... 85 or 75 to 80% survival at three years. That's the red line uh, with about 25% mortality uh, at three years. Uh, the folks discharged to an LTAC, that's 22% of our population. They have about 80% mortality at three years. And so uh, it really matters uh, with the condition of the patients at discharge. When I'm talking about our 39% uh, discharge uh, with neurologically favorable status, that largely excludes the LTAC discharges because those are generally the people who have significant neurologic impairment at the time of discharge. So those people are uh, by and large uh, the people in the red line. Now, when we compare the mortality to other groups of cardiac patients, uh, transplant patients have very low mortality at three years. Uh, the ECPR patients are more comparable to the LVAD population. And this is our ECPR cohort in total, both the LTAC and home or acute rehab populations combined, um, where they have um, approximately 40% uh, uh, mortality uh, at three years. So what we've done is we've really added a link to the chain of survival for cardiac arrest. We have not replaced any of the pre-existing links. So recognition, early CPR, uh, early BLS and ACLS, still critical and actually even more critical for these patients that are going to be receiving CPR for an hour. Then the ECMO pump uh, and eCPR program can be helpful. And the post-arrest care 
uh, becomes even more critical again with these people who have severe ischemic injuries from their cardiac arrest. So the thing to keep in mind as you're thinking about your eCPR program is that it really is a system. The ECMO is one piece of that system, but you really have to think about every component of the system to optimize recovery. So pre-hospital, you have to think about rapid mobilization, getting the patients to you as quickly as possible, getting them to the ECMO as quickly as possible, and having high quality CPR while doing that. Thinking in our case, the cath lab, but in the ED-based models, the ED as well, having a team rapidly available, the image guidance, uh, I believe to be critical for uh, effective uh, placement on ECMO, that's both the ultrasound and the uh, fluoro uh, to guide the placement of the cannulas distal perfusion cannulas as well. Then you have to have a decannulation plan. We primarily have patients decannulated via surgical uh, cut down and uh, decannulation, but you could also do percutaneous closure uh, or manual pressure. Um, we also need to think about the post ECMO care and that's obviously critical. The multidisciplinary care with perfusion, RT, uh, critical care, cardiology, et cetera, uh, and aggressive care to fix the problems that arise, but patient care uh, meaning that we have patients to allow our patients to survive and recover, and then also managing and helping the family recover through all of this because it's a very traumatic incident for everybody involved. So a few points um, about that process, the, the cannulation and post-recovery process. So vascular access, I mentioned the use of ultrasound, the most common complication of uh, ECMO placement in general, but especially in eCPR is vascular access issues. And if you're doing this without ultrasound, just keep in mind that artery and vein are both pulsatile with CPR often, and the arterial and venous blood are also very often blue. So really the ultrasound is critical to differentiate which vessel you're targeting and to place it effectively. Um, the other benefits of ultrasound guidance is you uh, have the speed that comes with it. And also you prevent uh, the multiple attempts, double punctures, um, and sidewall access, the things that can just make the bleeding worse um, after the fact. Even with ultrasound guidance, there are still complications from the vascular access site, but it drastically reduces those. We also uh, insert the cannulas across the right atrium from the groin again, across the right atrium into the SVC uh, for the venous cannula. And that I believe is, is part of the reason that we have the favorable cardiac recovery uh, and favorable hemodynamics that we have, we can very effectively drain the heart uh, and offload the heart with our cannula. And so with that, or to, to accomplish that, fluoro is important because now you need to make sure that you're crossing the right atrium safely um, and not uh, poking the cannula into the wall of the atrium, potentially causing problems. And also you need to make sure that you can land that cannula uh, appropriately in the SVC. Our goal for needle to ECMO time is about four to five minutes with a goal of patient at the cath lab door to initiation of ECMO about six to eight minutes. So it's fast and having all this image guidance uh, is very helpful. Once you have the cannulas in place, you then connect the circuit without any air and you initiate the ECMO. Once you have the ECMO flowing, you do need to stabilize the patient still with additional pressors in many cases. And I'll show you data for the percentage of patients with those. Um, but you do need to, to on, have ongoing resuscitation and support of the patient beyond just the ECMO. While the ECMO may provide four or five liters uh, of flow, it's not enough to uh, provide a, a perfusing map. So you do have to keep that in mind and continue to support the patient. Once you have support, you then can evaluate and treat underlying etiologies. And this shows you our data from our population, again, shockable rhythms uh, and refractory patients where 85% of those patients had significant coronary artery disease. Um, of those patients, it was about evenly split between one, two, and three vessel disease. So a complex coronary disease that needs to be fixed. For those patients without coronary disease, we often do a pulmonary angiogram. We may do an echo in the cath lab to look to make sure there's a tamponade, things that we can otherwise reverse also in the cath lab. For those with coronary disease, the most prominent vessel uh, is the LAD. Uh, though there are some patients with left main circ and RCA disease. And again, most patients have multi-vessel disease. Uh, so therefore uh, including multiple of those. Uh, it is complex disease with a syntax score of 29 on average and an acute uh, thrombotic lesion about 64% of patients. CTOs in about a third. So this is complex disease. We generally do not fix CTOs in this situation, uh, but we do fix some of the very complex disease 
and the hemodynamic support provided by ECMO is critical for that. Now, the question uh, on my mind as I think through this is really how important is coronary disease revascularization uh, for the survival of a patient? Now, we don't know at all uh, how important it is for the actual recovery of the patient. That's data we're still looking at in our own population. But this is data looking at the need for coronary revascularization for rhythm stabilization. Now, some of the patients come in with an organized rhythm. Effectively, they're shocked into PEA. Uh, but the question is, for those that are not, for those still with a shockable rhythm, uh, how critical is it to go ahead and, and, uh, and revascularize that coronary disease to achieve an organized rhythm? So if you look at the data here in the uh, bar graph, so we have some patients with intermittent ROSC. Uh, about 40% of our patients do have intermittent ROSC, but they still revert back into cardiac arrest, oftentimes after just a few seconds. Um, and then we have the majority of our patients that never have intermittent ROSC. If we look at the organized rhythm uh, bar there, we have 50% of our patients roughly that have an organized rhythm before they get to the cath lab, before they get ECMO. And these are the patients that are in PEA on arrival. We have about 25% of people that uh, then have an organized rhythm with defibrillation immediately after the ECMO, suggesting that really it was a perfusion issue. If we can perfuse the coronaries with the ECMO, then defibrillate, they can achieve and maintain an organized rhythm. We do have some portion of the patient, about 12%, that never achieve an organized rhythm. And those are the folks that I mentioned that die in the cath lab or declared dead in the cath lab. And then we do have about 20% of our patients that um, never achieve, uh, or 20% of the uh, patients with obstructive disease, but about 10% of our patients that don't achieve an organized rhythm until after they're uh, revascularized and PCI is performed. So that's the population where the revascularization is really critical for rhythm stabilization. And again, we don't know if it's revascularization is uh, still critical for recovery beyond just this small portion of the, of the patients. The majority of our patients, as I mentioned, do have obstructive disease. Um, and then the survival is shown there in the last bar graph. If you look at the table on the bottom, um, the presence of obstructive coronary disease is not really predictive of ROSC. Um, it's the same, uh, those, like, those folks that have intermittent ROSC, um, it's the same percentage in obstructive and non-obstructive coronary disease. Uh, but what the obstructive coronary disease does is really shift the likelihood of getting an organized rhythm until later with again, 20% of the people requiring revascularization to achieve an organized rhythm and uh, about the same uh, number of people uh, requiring uh, the ECMO to achieve an organized rhythm. So um, really, again, just sort of an added uh, necessity for that 20% of the people with obstructive coronary disease to even get an organized rhythm, which then of course is what's required for them to be admitted to the hospital. So some points now about the management of people with VA ECMO. So this is, and this again is our protocol and what we have done. And I will freely admit that we continuously learn from our patients and there are different ways of doing this. So I'm not meaning to present this as the one way to do it, but I think uh, it's a starting place. So we aim to maintain blood pressures between a map of 65 and 100. This is to some extent based on the idea that 65 is probably an average low or uh, lowest needed uh, threshold map uh, for adequate perfusion. And the 100 is based more on the LVAD literature with reduced um, pulsatility and the concern that perhaps higher than that would predispose people to bleeding. Though again, there's this is extrapolation from other populations. The inotropes and pressors are used to maintain the map of 65 and typically it's pressors. We minimize the use of inotropes because we have perfusion provided by the ECMO circuit. We do use vasodilators in some patients because they become hypertensive and we want to keep again the map below 100. We try to minimize the vent settings on the, the ventilator um, and use rest settings because again the ECMO provides oxygenation and ventilation so we generally do not need to push the lungs to provide those uh, resources to the human. Um, so we may, a couple examples, we may use pressure control um, or, uh, or volume control with very um, lung protective settings. We're able to maintain body temperature with the ECMO circuit. We often, as I mentioned, also put in a cooling catheter to control the temperature um, and maintain that 34 degree target temperature that we use. Um, if you do not control the temperature, and we see this with some of the folks 
that are accumulated at other hospitals in our state that then transferred to us, can, patients continue to lose heat on the ECMO circuit and they may get very cold and have uh, ramifications from that like bleeding, et cetera. So um, controlling the body temperature is an important consideration yeah, and maintaining their warmth actually is sometimes harder than cooling them down. Sedation is also important, uh, though we do minimize it. We use BIS, uh, a BIS machine to maintain sedation sufficient uh, for par paralytics if we need those to maintain the, the temperature, um, but we uh, try to minimize the sedation so we don't get an issue later with prolonged periods of uh, sedation vacation to allow them to try to wake up. We're able to achieve hemodynamic stabilization in essentially every patient with the combination of ECMO plus pressors um, within those goals that I mentioned. And that's shown here. So here the, and for the next few graphs, patients will be split between the blue lines, which is the survivors, the red lines of people who died of some cause not related to brain death, and then the green lines, which are patients who died due to brain death. And this is meant to, dis, to separate people who survived, died, and those who had probably the most severe injury, those who died from brain death. And you can see that the map or the blood pressures that we're able to achieve here well within our goals uh, for all three of those patient populations. The heart rates start uh, in a reasonable range, but lower uh, primarily because of the temperature. And then as we rewarm them, their, their uh, heart rates tend to pick up. And then uh, the lactic acid levels are generally an average around 12 or 13. And then they tail off. And actually the survivors tend to normalize within the first 24 hours whereas the other groups are a little bit slower. We do provide uh, ECMO, as I mentioned, in uh, the majority of these patients, um, but we'd have an assortment of different options. So for those patients who uh, do have an organized rhythm and a blood pressure that's just really low on arrival, as will happen in any refractory population, um, some of them will actually essentially achieve ROS, though maybe just be hypotensive on arrival. We will provide just a balloon pump for those patients. Those who have some pulsatility, um, but are um, very hypotensive in PEA um, uh, arrest on arrival will get ECMO only. And usually those patients manifest as they come in still getting CPR with cardiac arrest, we put them on ECMO. And then we see that their pressures are supported with the ECMO and they have just a small amount of pulsatility. So at that point, we'll leave them with ECMO alone. If they have no pulsatility and we, or less than 10 millimeters of mercury of pulsatility, or they have very severe coronary disease, we will put in a balloon pump in addition. This is meant to drive more blood down the coronaries and provide uh, improved recovery. Whether that helps or not in our population, we do not know. There are some meta-analyses that look at balloon pumps that show benefit of a balloon pump uh, as compared to, to ECMO alone. Uh, and so perhaps that is beneficial, but this has been our protocol from the beginning. We had a few patients, three of them uh, at the very beginning that we also put in an impella, but generally we do not use impella in addition to ECMO at this point. Uh, we do not see that it's uh, necessary for cardiac recovery uh, in our population. The ECMO flows uh, that we use are shown in the bottom left there. Uh, the patients that have brain death tend to develop severe vasoplegia, and so we uh, increase our flows even higher and we can achieve higher flows because of that vasoplegia, whereas the other groups generally were around three and a half liters of flow. Um, I mentioned many of our patients, um, the majority require additional pressor that's shown here. Um, survivors also, the majority have pressor at the beginning, uh, but then it tails off over the first two days, whereas the other two groups still require pressors in the majority of patients. Uh, and then we have a few patients that do receive vasodilators as well. Uh, most patients require transfusions of some sort, um, whether it be because of some slow access site oozing or true bleeding um, or trauma related to CPR. Um, but uh, certainly those who die of other death um, require more than the other groups uh, of at least red cells. And part of that is because uh, they may have died in part because of trauma. I mentioned trauma and it's, it's very common in this population after an hour of CPR. Uh, the presence of rib fractures, the lung injury, which you can include in that aspiration, contusion, uh, and probably some pulmonary edema as well uh, in 77% of patients. Pneumothoraces, hemothoraces, some requiring chest tubes are all present. Um, abdominal bleeding uh, and RP bleeds are uncommon, but are present and need to be assessed. And the picture on the right is a patient, one of our more dramatic cases where this patient was uh, 
successfully placed on ECMO, admitted to the hospital, but then over time decompensated uh, and had um, very low ECMO flows because of the high pressures because of tamponade. And we drained the blood initially at the bedside. They went to the OR uh, where they found this quarter size hole in the RV where the uh, fractured sternum had been pushed through by CPR. They patched that hole. Uh, he came out of the OR, actually spent two weeks in the hospital and was discharged in great condition. Now is back to playing the organ with his church. So uh, certainly a, a success story that's brought about and really emphasized the point that aggressive care from everybody involved, being willing to take a patient like this to the OR after an hour of CPR, who's comatose um, in the ICU on ECMO, but still willing to take him to the OR to look for causes and to fix the underlying cause of this tamponade that was uh, reducing his ECMO flows. So as we think about post-cardiac arrest syndrome, typically we think about a combination of brain injury, heart injury, and this underlying SERSI vasoplegic state. With refractory cardiac arrest, you have injury from everything else as well. And all of those things need to be treated. Some of the data is shown here, and I don't mean to belabor the point, but certainly ejection fractions start low, uh, but increase almost universally over time, back to almost normal. Troponins can be very high, but are certainly elevated in almost everybody. Uh, most patients have some degree of AKI, uh, though uh, recover. Um, liver injury is common, but then decreases and improves over time. Glucoses can be quite high and insulin requirements can be quite high, particularly in those with the most severe injuries. When we look at lung injury, uh, we have some data here uh, splitting the lungs into four segments. And we look at the posterior segments predominantly are affected um, on uh, chest CT. And this could be edema, aspiration, or again, contusion. Um, anterior segments can also be affected. Um, it doesn't seem that survival is related to the, those effects or the degree of lung injury uh, as shown here in the right bar graph. Basically, um, the survivors have the same profile of zero to two uh, areas affected, three to five, and six to eight areas affected, as do the folks who die of brain death or other death. Compliance and driving pressure are high for this patient population. So the driving pressure is shown here initially um, because we have the benefits of ECMO, we don't have to push the driving pressure too high. Without the ECMO, it would be, but the compliance is low uh, here with a compliance about 30 uh, milliliters per uh, centimeter of, of water. Uh, and that does, for the survivors, at least improve over time, though all groups sort of trend toward improvement. Uh, but the survivors tend to improve um, closer to normal. The uh, PO2, though, despite those issues with lungs, we can really support the PO2 and the CO2 with uh, the ECMO. So you can see, if anything, we overshoot the range we'd want to have uh, with the PAO2, and we work continuously with our perfusionists and ECMO specialists to bring that down so that we're not uh, hyper-oxygenating. Um, and that is an important thing to note uh, when you're starting, just to try to minimize that uh, overshoot on the O2. Uh, same with CO2, it's really efficiently removed with ECMO, and so you really want to keep a close eye on it to make sure that you don't uh, drive the CO2 too low and cause cerebral vasoconstriction. Some complications of ECMO, of course, the, the um, highest risk in general uh, of our population is access site bleeding, but uh, lower extremity ischemia is also still possible. In this case, because we put uh, distal perfusion cannulas in everybody, it's rare, but still we see it in about 3% of people. RP bleeds in about 5% um, requiring transfusions and dialysis in about 12%, though I will say for those folks discharged home, none of them have required dialysis after discharge. So Half of those people with dialysis die while in the hospital, the other half um, are discharged without the need for dialysis ongoing. Recovery is definitely a marathon uh, and can take a substantial amount of time. So this is showing these benchmarks in, in uh, hospital care uh, over the course of duration of their hospitalization. And about half the people are following commands by day five or six. Uh, those that are, are extubated shortly thereafter. They spend uh, about 50% of people will, will spend about uh, two weeks in the ICU or a week and a half, uh, whereas uh, they spend about two to three weeks in the hospital. But you can see the other half of the patients can be quite prolonged. And so if you really want to optimize your survivors, you have to really be patient and allow them the time to follow commands. This is not the population where you can stick to the AHA guidelines of 72 hours of prognosticating 72 hours after they're rewarmed. Now, one of the, the um, albeit sad um, 
outcomes of death for these patients, it is helpful that they tend to die early as well. So half of the patients, because of the substantial brain injury that's the driver of death in most of these patients, um, about 70% of these patients will die of a neurologic injury, half of them will have died by day five. And so if you um, think about developing the program uh, overall, the, the patients sort of screen themselves out early as well, to some extent, though some do uh, take much longer to differentiate themselves. And so as an intensivist, this is my favorite piece of data, just showing if I show up in that patient's room on any given day, what is the likelihood of survival if they have not followed commands and have not been declared dead? And so if you look at day zero, it's about 43% survival. And actually over the first few days, that rate of survival is pretty constant because you have patients dying early and also some patients following commands uh, early. And so it stays pretty stable if anything goes up a bit in terms of their chance of survival if I walk into the patient's room on day five. But if I, over time from that point, it starts to drift off. And if I walk into the patient's room at day 10, they have about a 35% survival, even if they're not following commands uh, and have not been declared dead. If you look at two weeks, it's still around 30%, 25 to 30%. And then it still it drifts off over time, even out to 25 days, which is when our last survival survivor started to follow commands. So it can be very prolonged recovery, and you have to have, as an intensivist, uh, the uh, perspective that even late on, later on in the course, they can still have a chance of recovery. We are working on earlier prognostication efforts. This is some unpublished data from us looking at various studies, looking at neurologic prognostication. There are a few tests that actually at 24 hours can be highly predictive of poor outcomes. That is an isoelectric EEG uh, is about 100% specific for that. Cerebral edema on the very initial head CT as they're going from our cath lab to the ICU, they get the, the trauma non-contrast pan scan. And if they have cerebral edema on that head CT, uh, we, don't, we have yet to have a survivor. Uh, the absent brainstem reflexes at 24 hours, uh, that's also uh, a nearly 100% specificity. Enoxic brain injury on that initial head CT is a little bit lower, but um, above 95% specificity. And a neuron-specific enolase level that is greater than five times the upper limit of normal is also 95% uh, specificity. GCS is poorly specific, uh, but highly sensitive. And um, S100B, another biomarker uh, brain injury, um, is less specific as well. So uh, we're still, again, we have not published this data, but still looking at these early neuroprognostication efforts to see if we could screen out some people destined for poor outcomes as early as one day into their care. Now, time is very critical for this intervention. And so this is data looking at duration of professional CPR and survival, comparing our data, the eCPR group from the University of Minnesota in the blue bars versus the ELPS, the amiodarone arm of the ELPS trial uh, in the orange. The, the ELPS trial included people who were refractory to at least one shock, randomized them between amiodarone, lidocaine, and placebo. And so we took the amiodarone arm of that. They had about 63% survival for patients who received zero to nine minutes of CPR, and then it decreased by 17% about every 10 minutes. We have 100% survival for patients who get to us within 30 minutes, but then it drifts off about 25% every 10 minutes. So this tells you how critical getting people on ECMO is in terms of the time. Neurologic death and, and brain death in particular increases with those longer periods of time as you might expect. So really that's what we're up against is brain injury. And you can see that also in the blood gas as the pH drops off, the lactates uh, start to skyrocket after about 40 minutes of CPR. And this is animal data looking at the mean arterial pressure and the coronary perfusion pressure over time. And you can see that it peaks around 20 minutes and starts to tail off. And that's probably what's leading to our decrease in survival. To uh, deal with that situation and the time sensitivity, we've created the mobile ECMO process here in the, uh, uh, Minnesota, where we're now meeting patients at out, outlying uh, emergency departments where we cannulate them in those emergency departments, take them to the cath lab there, and then bring them back to the University of Minnesota for the ICU care um, to provide the sort of detailed multi multidisciplinary care. These are the patients that we had over the first four months of that program. So I mentioned 160 patients over the first four months of our university-based program. Over the first four months of this program, we had 60 patients. So really a much broader reach covering much more territory and pulling people from very far away. This is what I mean by the optimism of paramedics 
driving from very far away, those orange circles really delineate a theoretical 30 minute travel time. So again, about 58 patients um, with this cohort, very similar uh, groups of patients excluded uh, and 43% leaving the hospital neurologically favorable status. So we've now been building this truck to bring ECMO to people's front yards, again, to further reduce the time. The truck is now completely built. We're training in it and we'll hopefully be rolling it out in the next couple of months uh, to provide that care. Um, and then I'll have more data to show you later. So the future, uh, we can do a lot with the ECMO circuit already. We can do TTM and rewarm. We can connect the dialysis straight to the circuit. The hope is that in the future, we could actually address the blood more directly by removing things like uh, maladaptive cytokines or free radicals. We can do a lot more monitoring than we're currently doing, perhaps lactic acid levels or heart or brain injury markers. Um, and because we have access to the whole blood volume, we can really theoretically do a lot with this. It's just not technologically yet available, but hopefully will be coming soon. But really the near future will focus on delivery and improving that time to ECMO where I think we can really provide great improvements in outcomes. So some summary points. So eCPR has now become this critical link for patients with refractory cardiac arrest. Multi-system organ failure is ubiquitous. I like to call it pan-system organ failure. High quality 24 seven multidisciplinary critical care is absolutely critical for these patients and recovery can be very prolonged, uh, but durable if we allow them the time to survive. Uh, and so we must really strengthen every link in the chain of survival. We all participate in, in one or more links um, that's definitely true of the critical care, but also the pre-hospital setting and everything else. So we all need to take part in, in trying to strengthen those links in the chain. And thank you. Feel free to email me. My email is there as well. If ever you have any questions, concerns, or want to talk about programs or, or complex uh, patients, I'm happy to chat. Thank you so much for your attention and for the invitation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jason. What a fantastic uh, look at what you're doing in that beautiful area over there. Uh, I'm sure you're poaching from Rochester as well. I'm kidding, of course, but uh, we a lot of people want to ask questions. Uh, the top two people I'm going to put on are people who would be leading a similar program here. Michael Redlener, followed by Gregory Sirao. Uh, the two of you should uh, probably uh, take it away. We have seven minutes because the next critical care meeting is at 2 p.m. Uh, sharp. Go ahead, uh, Mike. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. I'm an EMS and emergency physician. I work regionally with our EMS um, uh, group, and I also uh, work in the emergency department here at Mount Sinai. So uh, one of the questions I have for you is about the criteria for uh, enrolling people in uh, getting the getting ECMO. Um, and the, the specific question is around PEA, uh, witness PEA arrest. And I'm wondering about that decision and how you came to it. Um, I know that there's debate in the community. There is. And so PEA is complex because it's a mixed bag of etiologies where the shock rhythms are primarily coronary diseases I showed. I think there are subsets of the PEA population that would likely benefit from this. If you have uh, the ability to get to people quickly, that probably broadens that category. But if you think about a PE, for instance, a pulmonary embolus, uh, the CPR is going to be very inefficient with pulmonary embolus. So I think the, the window for successful cannulation for that truly causing PEA is probably very narrow. Uh, whereas PEA from just profound hypotension, so let's say a septic patient, where you actually do have some flow, it's just not enough to cause a pulse. You can probably augment that a, a bit with CPR, they may have a longer window. And I think as, again, as we can get to people faster, I think we'll be able to test that ground. If you're just starting an eCPR program and you want to truly optimize your uh, recovery and your survival rates, I think shockable rhythms are the place to start and the data from Paris and British Columbia and all these other places would back that up. But there's no harm from the patient perspective of starting uh, with some PA, some selected PA patients, as you said, maybe witnessed, and short down times um, if you have the opportunity. We continue to talk about it and we'll probably be expanding to PA in the next year or two as our truck gets rolling and our process improves. I think it's a good point. Very Thanks good. so much, appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. Great. Hey, John, my, 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gidwani. Uh, so my, my name is Greg. Uh, I'm one of the interventional cardiologists here. I have a lot of your same interests and I, I just wanna thank you. This was a great talk and you know all the work that you've done with Dr. Yiannopoulos over the last five years has really been inspirational. Um, I, I've studied your protocol a lot and uh, obviously that protocol is robust and effective, but I, I, there's a few things it seems that you, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, there, there's a few things that you emphasize that it seems that you know recent data conflicts with a little bit. Uh, and there's three things I was hoping you can comment on specifically. Um, and that's, you know, one, the, the not routine use of LV venting. The, the second was the decision to do complete revascularization versus culprit only. And, and the last and most recent is the decision to continue to target a low temperature hypothermia post arrest. So I, I know that's a broad question, but anything you could add would be great and very much appreciated. No, those are great. All of those are great questions and really touch on a lot of controversies in the world of cardiac arrest care in general. So I'll start with the TTM. Obviously, TTM2 trial came out suggesting there's no benefit of uh, cooling to 33 degrees versus 37.5 or basically fever prevention in patients with cardiac arrest. Now, the problem with that trial is we we, as we extrapolate to our patient population is that none of our patients are included in that trial. The median time of CPR was 23 minutes they had ROSC in the field. And so that's not this group. Now, it may still be true that cooling may not benefit this group, but we also have other places where we use cooling where we do believe it to be beneficial, like in the OR for aortic cases, where we still cool to 18 degrees uh, for those some of those patients. And so I think we have to think about if any population was going to benefit from cooling, this is probably the one. And until we have data to go against it, I would suggest at least what we have done is, is use cooling. Uh, remember the, the one downside or the one demonstrable uh, side effect and complication of cooling in the TTM2 trial was arrhythmia, and it was probably at least predominantly bradycardia. And so we've got ECMO supporting us through all of that. That is not a problem. So I think that we're in a relatively no harm scenario and we can possibly provide a benefit. To the extent of, of and I'm, I'm happy to go back and touch on any of those points. I'm just trying to get through all your points in the time. Um, the coronary vascularization, I probably emphasized a little incorrectly. We do primarily stick to culprits. So we're not fixing every 70% lesion. We're fixing the things that are 90, 95% where we see less than Timmy three flow down an artery or where there's a thrombotic occlusion. So we're not strictly, we're not fixing everything going for complete revascularization at that moment. At the same time, we're not truly culprit only either. We are uh, somewhere in between. So, um, and that does, you know, that conflicts a bit and you can argue again, we don't know in this state, in this patient condition, what you need for recovery and prevention of the re-arrest uh, or the recurrent arrhythmia. Uh, so that's where we've landed and we've tried to stay relatively consistent until we can demonstrate some data in our population that makes us think otherwise. Um, and then the third question, I'm sorry, what was the third? LV venting, it only oh, yes. Time. Thank you, yes, LV venting, sorry. So the LV venting question is a very real issue. So I would suggest that, that we, and we are going to have data coming out that conflicts with the relatively data um, sparse belief that you need to unload to remove fluid from the LV. So this is, I think what we have is a scenario that sort of makes sense that offloading the LV would be good um, to reduce uh, energy use, but what we, I think have missed as a field. And I think my analogy is the tandem heart. So many of us would believe that if you put in a tandem heart device, you, un you unload the LV. And this is why I accentuated our placement of the venous cannula, because we are really by placing the venous cannula in the SVC and getting such complete drainage of the right side, we are actually really effectively offloading the heart and effectively unloading the LV of, via the RA. So I'm not disagreeing with the idea that we need to prevent uh, high LVDPs and prevent um, blood accumulation in the LV. And if we have a uh, lack of pulsatility, a complete lack of pulsatility, we do put in a balloon pump, which probably removes a little bit of blood, not much from the LV. But I think what the impella and the, the balloon pump probably do best and why they've shown a benefit in these, these uh, meta-analyses that have been done is that they improve coronary perfusion. And so that's why I think our balloon pumps are doing effectively um, as much as the impellas if you're draining effectively from the right side. And I know that some people do not place the venous cannula in that position, so they don't drain as well. And they probably do have more of an issue with 
uh, LV filling than we do. So I think they sort of go hand in hand and probably our population sort of optimized for not needing it. If that's, that's great, thanks. So perfect, yeah. perfect. Thanks so much and fantastic Thank talk. You. Thanks so much. Thank you. I you. urge everyone to uh, you know, uh, note down Dr. Bartos's uh, email and email him directly. But clearly, we're going to have him back again around this time next year when his brand shiny new truck is uh, <laughs> flying the streets of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate it. You're doing such amazing work. You serve as role models for the rest of the nation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'll look forward to next year. Of course, thank you. Thank you.